church. Well, grace, mercy, and peace be to you, Oops. dear friends in Christ, both here and at home. We welcome you today to worship, and if you're just joining us this morning online from worship, we're glad that you could join us today. Take a moment to let us know who you are and where you're worshiping from today, and make sure to hit that share button, because there may be somebody who is in your life and on your social media feed that needs to hear about what to do when you're experiencing sadness. What do you do when God is sad? And so let's join together as we um, take a moment and as we bring together the end of this series, as we wrap up on this series on emotions. And I hope you've been blessed by this. You know, in week one, we looked at how does God bring comfort to those who are hurting, right? And in week two, how do you have peace in the midst of anxiety? And in week three, how does God bring healing to when my heart is angry, right? And today, I want to look at this emotion that most people don't think about, a lot like last week, when it comes to Jesus. And that's the emotion of sadness. I mean, think about Jesus for just a moment, and often we equate joy rather than sadness with Jesus. There's many things in Jesus' life that brought him joy, right? When he would heal somebody who was hurting, that brought joy to his life. When he helped somebody who felt rejected know his love, it brought joy to his life. When he had the opportunity to forgive somebody and, and offer that forgiveness in Christ's name, it brought joy to his life. And he rejoiced with the angels in heaven. But occasionally, Jesus would cry. And occasionally, Jesus was sad. But have you ever thought about this? What makes God sad? What makes Jesus just sit down with his head in his arms, with tears in his eyes? What makes him sad? And I guess maybe that's a question that we could all wrestle with this morning. What are things that make you sad today? What are things that bring tears to your eyes? If you're in person this morning, what I'd love for you to do is just take a moment on your handout and write down one or two things that genuinely just bring tears to your eyes today. You know, things that maybe are happening in this world, things that are happening in the world around you, in your own personal life. What are some things that bring tears to your eyes, right? What makes you sad? And if you're online, do me a favor if you want to, in the comment section, what are some things that, that generally break your heart? Especially maybe things that we see in this world, right? I'd like you to go ahead and do that right now. And as you do that, I want to share just a couple of things for you that cause heartbreak to me, that bring sadness to my life. Um, as I think about these, like some of the things are very personal, right? When someone I care about or deeply love is really sick or in the hospital or dying, it, I genuinely, my heart aches. When I watch families who have division, especially between like parents and children, and there's a real division and conflict, and it's not getting any better, my heart genuinely hurts. When someone, especially a child, is abused, whether it be emotionally abuse, physical abuse, spiritual abuse, my heart genuinely aches and, and, and it just, it, there's just tears that, that are uncontrollable at times. But I'll tell you what really hurts is when I watch somebody walk away from God. When I watch somebody reject God's love. When I watch somebody go, I no longer want to be a part of a church, and I no longer want to be a part of a community, and I no longer want to be in a relationship with God, that genuinely hurts deeply my heart. What makes you sad? What makes God sad? What makes Jesus sad? Let me give you a couple examples as we think about this, right? In the Old Testament, if you go back, way back, all the way to the book of Genesis, right? In Genesis chapter 6, right before this worldwide flood is about to take place, right? God makes a statement that reveals His grieving heart. Listen to it. The Lord saw the wickedness of man, and it was great in the earth, right? And that every intention and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, right? And the Lord, watch this, this is the only time we ever see this in the Scriptures, right? That the Lord regretted that he had made man 
on the earth. And watch this. It grieved him to his heart. He was sad. Now we jump forward a little bit, and we see that there's several moments where Jesus experiences his own grief and his own sadness. There's this beautiful story in John chapter 11 where Jesus goes to the city of Bethany, and as he's approaching the city of Bethany, he learns that his dear friend Lazarus has died. And so when he goes to meet his two good friends, Mary and Martha, he consoles both of them. He wraps his arms around both of them. His tears are in his eyes. And in John chapter 11, it says in a very plain, simple language, and Jesus wept. He wept. He cried. He shed tears over the loss of a friend, even knowing that he was about to resurrect that same friend from the dead. Jesus still wept. He still wept. There's another beautiful scene. Jesus is looking out over the city of Jerusalem. He's about to enter into the city of Jerusalem for the celebration of Holy Week. He sees the thousands of people, as we saw last week, crowding the city streets for the celebration of the Passover. And as he sits up on that mountain ridge, and he's looking over and he sees everything. He sees the big picture, if you will. He weeps and he cries and he mourns over Jerusalem, according to Luke chapter 18. He began to weep. Now why did he cry? Well, you've got to remember why he came to understand why he cried. Jesus came to bring me life and to bring you life and so that we could live this life abundantly. He came to seek and to save everything that was lost. He to proclaim the good news for the poor, recovery for the sight and the blind, and to set people free from their, from their bondage to sin and suffering. He came not for the righteous, but for sinners. He came not for the healthy, but for the sick. He came to show the love of the Father. So what makes him cry over this city? Well, he looked at Jerusalem. and What he saw wrecked him to the core. And he cries out in Luke 13, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often I've wanted to gather your children together. Now look, at the, watch this image. I wanted to be like a hen that protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. Do you see the image there? God makes this beautiful image. If you've ever raised chickens, you'll understand this, okay? If you've never raised chickens, that's quite all right. I remember my first engagement with chickens. It was on my grandmother's farm. And Grandma told me this. She said, go take this green bucket. She had the same green bucket for probably 40 years, okay? All right, she said, go pick up the eggs. And she said, and so I'm walking down the hill, and she says, oh, David, don't forget, watch out for the chicken snakes. I handed that bucket back to Grandma real quick. I said, what? I ain't going anywhere where there's a snake. All right. Y'all, 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 seriously, I never picked up eggs for grandma ever again, right? Okay, all right. And so, so what would happen was the hen would have to protect her chicks. See, that's the image that Jesus says. He looks over the city and he says, listen, I want to be like the hen who protects his little chicks. I want to care for you, right? But look at the last statement. What does he say? He says, but you wouldn't let me. And I wonder how often that's still true. I wonder how often that's still true. Is that God wants to love on us and care for us and nourish us and protect us and defend us and take care of us and we just in our stubbornness and in our pride and in our arrogance and our own sinfulness, we go, but I'm not going to let you. See, Jesus is sad because He wants to love them, but they refuse His love. He wants to love them but they refuse His love. And there's an amazing story in the New Testament that brings this out better than anything else. It's in Luke chapter 15. So if you've got your Bibles and you want to go there, you can do that right now. But in Luke chapter 15, right, there's this beautiful story of a father and two sons. And one of the sons comes to talk to his father one day, and he says to the dad, he says to his father, he says, Dad, I'm done. I want my inheritance. I want out of the family business. I'm leaving. 
Now you have to imagine that this just didn't come up you know, abruptly, right? That just one day he wakes up and says, I'm done, right? Because especially in that culture, when you were a father and you had sons, if your son came and told you, I'm done, I want my money, I want out, that's like telling dad, well, I can't say what it is. All right, but it starts with an H. Go to H, right? Okay, or, or it's another way of saying, you're dead to me. We're just dead. We're done. Okay? And so he says, I'm done with you, right? And he says, give me my money. I'm gone, right? And here's what the father does. He says, okay. Despite the arrogant, rebellious, insurrecting son, he gives him exactly what he asks for. Now, I don't know what led to this son's decision. Neither do you. We don't know what kind of relationship that father and son had. We won't even speculate. We don't know why the younger son wanted to leave and be done with his family, be done with his brother, and we dare not. But what we can know clearly is this by the Scriptures, is that the father is clearly hurt. Amen? The father is clearly hurt by his son's actions. And you see that sadness Every day as the father stands outside of his home on the porch looking over the fields and waiting day after day after day just for the son to come home. And I can imagine that father's sadness. I can really, in, in some my own way, understand his hurt, right? Especially as the reports came in, right? As the reports, if you were to put it in a modern context, is... Well, your son made it to Vegas. He checked into the Venetian. He's living the high roller lifestyle with his new friends, right? He's gambling. He's drinking. He's enjoying the ladies. He lost big last night. The money's run out. His friends have bailed. He's now on the streets. He's begging for food. He's begging for work. Got on with a pig farmer today. He's shoveling crap, shoveling sloth. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine the sadness of the father? Can you imagine from a distance the father watching his son from a distance struggling so much? Watching him make one bad decision after another and watching him just be so lost. His heart, which is the same heart that Jesus bled and died with, is saddened. It's saddened when he sees his children who are lost. Right? I want you to understand that. The heart of God is desperately saddened when he sees his children lost. But it goes even deeper. Watch this in verse 17. Watch what happens. Jesus said, the young man came to his senses, and he said, how many of my father's hired servants had food to spare? And here I am, I'm just starving to death, right? He realizes, oh my goodness, life is so much better with dad. I know I've messed up. I know I hurt my father. Maybe, just maybe, I can go back home, and he'll treat me like one of his paid servants. They eat better than I do. Now watch what happens. Verse 18. The son got up, and he went back to the father. And you know what happens? You have these moments where you're rehearsing in your mind what you're going to say when you get there. Y'all give me an amen if you've ever done that, right? I remember the day that I wrecked my uncle's truck. Man, I was, reverse, I was rehearsing in my mind all the way home exactly what to say to my mom and dad. Now, it was a lie. I mean, it wasn't the truth. No, I mean, like, it was the biggest lie ever story you could ever possibly imagine. And I told this, and I realized that my mom was watching the early service, and so I was like, I may have to have a conversation with mom when I get home now. <laughs> but it was a lie, right? And I was rehearsing that lie all the way home, right? 
Well, at least the son is being honest, right? He's rehearsing this all the way home, and he's thinking to himself all the way home, look, I'll just go up to my dad, and I'll say, look, I sinned against you. I sinned against heaven, right? It's going to be a little dramatic, but oh, it's true, right? I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. You just treat me, dad, like a hired servant. So all the way home, he is rehearsing this message in his head over and over and over again, over and over and over again. And it shows us, man, that Jesus uses this this scene, right, to show us how broken we can become and how the Father is sad because here's what he thinks. He says he thinks he's no longer worthy. Just treat me like a servant. The son actually believes that his actions have disqualified him from the family. The son actually believes that his sins have made him so unworthy that he can no longer be called a son. And i got to ask you this morning, how many people walk away from God believing the exact same thing? Amen. How many of you know folks who believe that? That because of their actions, because of their decisions, because of their failures, because of their mistakes, that they are too far gone from God. That they no longer can be considered worthy enough to be part of the family. That they can't even step foot into a church. How many people are afraid, right? I mean, you know this, right? How many people are afraid to step foot into church? And here's what they're thinking in their head. If I step foot in the church, the roof is going to what? fall down right the roof's going to collapse thunder's going to come crashing down why because they believe that they are so unworthy of the god who loves us and forgives us that they are afraid to step foot in the presence of the god who cares about them why because they're lost and they believe something about god that is completely untrue and god's heart is breaking over this god's heart is breaking over this How many people believe they got to get their life together before they can approach God? And so let me just say this real clearly, right? For everyone who has ever felt unworthy of God's love, if that is you, you can give me a thumbs up in the chat stream. You don't have to raise your hand in the room, but I just want you to know this. If you have ever felt unworthy of God's love, if you have ever felt you don't have a place if you ever feel that you are too far gone from the God who loves you, I want you to hear exactly these words. Watch this. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he felt compassion. And he ran and he embraced and he kissed him and he told him how much he loved him. The father's sadness is met with overwhelming compassion and love. Why? Because his son came home. And if there's one thing that I have learned in in, in all these years that God has blessed me in ministry, right? Listen, I hope you hear it very clearly. If there's one thing that matters, matters to the Father more than anything else, he just wants you to come home. That's it. Because if you're home, then we can deal with everything else. If you're home, we can fix what's broken. If you're home, we can deal with the shame and guilt. If you're home, I can love you and forgive you unconditionally. I just want you home, is what the Father says. It's what the Father tells me. Why? Because the joy is found as the Father brings us home as He makes us worthy, as He washes us clean, as He gives us new clothes, as He fixes the mess, as He throws the celebration party. Why? Because we were lost, but now we are found. We were dead, but now we are alive, and we are home. Now, guess what? That would make a great ending for the story, amen? Wouldn't that be a, just a great fairy tale ending, right? But here's the thing. The story keeps going. And it's a story that I honestly believe speaks to us truly. See, if the story of the first son reveals the sadness of the father for children who are lost, the story of the second reveals the sadness the father has for children who don't get it. Remember, there's two sons. The older son is on his way home. He's coming from the field, and he hears the music, and he hears the party, and he sees that all these things are going on, right? And so he asks one of the servants, hey, what is going on here? 
And the servant tells him that your brother has come home and your dad has killed the fattened calf and now he's throwing a lavish celebration and has invited all of the neighbors. And the son, the older son, instead of saying, yeah, let's party. My brother's home, hot dog. You know what he does? He sulks and he whines and he complains. And he's frustrated and he's irritated. Why? Now you would think he'd be excited, but he's not. Watch what happens. Dad comes out and he says this. He was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and asked him, hey, what's wrong? Why don't you come in and celebrate with us? And he answered the father in this way. Look, these many years I've served you I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. That I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, right, he devoured your property with wine, women, and booze. You killed the fattened calf for him, and you celebrated. What's wrong? The older brother is the good son. If you know what I'm talking about, give me an amen. He's the good son. The older brother is the good son. He's the one who never did anything wrong. He's the one who always followed the rules. He's the one who showed up for church every Sunday. He's the one who gave his offering. He's the one who served whenever asked. He was always there. And yet, despite being there, he never understood what he really had. And he never connected with the heart and the gifts of the Father. And let me just say this, as I look at the world in which we live in and I look at the church, here's what I believe. I believe the church is full with a lot of older brothers. People who grew up in the church all their life. I grew up in the church my whole life, and I can see this in myself at times. You grow up in the church your whole life, but you never fully get what you actually have. You never fully embraced the God who loves you and forgives you, calls you by name, brings you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You've never really fully embraced what you deserve so that you can understand what you have been given. You never fully have, have, have reveled deeply in the grace and the forgiveness of God as a lost and condemned sinner. You've never understood this relationship. You've seen God as a chore. You've seen God rather than a relationship to be cultivated. It is a box to be checked. Amen. Come on now. How many of y'all with me now? How many of you know what I'm talking about right now? Just raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about, right? God is not a relationship to be cultivated. It is a box to be checked. There are thousands upon thousands of people who grew up in the church, and it is no fault of the church. It's just this is what happens to us. is we grow up in the church, and we grow up in this, this, this community of faith, right? And somewhere along the line, instead of having this life-giving, life-changing, altering relationship with God, we see it as something to be done a box to be checked, a chore to be completed. We do all the right things for dad, but we never really get who dad is. We go to church because we think it's something we should do rather than someone to encounter. We speak the liturgy, we recite the creed as a checkbox to take place rather than something that brings life into our spirit. We sing songs and we kind of go through the motion, right? Because we're afraid to let our spirit connect with the music and understand that God is speaking deeply into our hearts. We give an offering almost out of convenience rather than simply believing that as this offering is an act of worship for the God who gave me everything. Go to a Bible study and we take lots of notes We never let the notes sink in and actually change who we are. We serve on a committee because we think that's the right thing to do rather than serving as a way of God of using himself inside of us and the gifts that he's given to us to change people's lives. We pray to God and we say the Lord's Prayer not as something to actually believe that I'm having a conversation with God. That I'm actually talking to the God of the universe. But I'm going through it. 
check the boxes, but we never embrace the Father who is there, who is giving us everything. And I believe that the heart of God is saddened as he watches Christians go through life never understanding or fully embracing what they really have. I know. I was one of them. I spent years in the church as a teenager, as a young adult, going through the motions and never fully embracing who God really was. And maybe you have too. So hear these words. The father looks at his son and he cries out to me and he cries out to you and he cries out to everyone at home. And this is what he says. Let's all say it together. Ready? On the count of three. Let's just read this together because I want you to hear this so beautifully, right? On the count of three. One, two, three. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. Now let's replace the word son with daughter, okay? Let's say it again on the count of three. One, two, three. And he said to him, daughter, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. Everything is yours. Jesus went to the cross to rescue the lost Jesus went to the cross for everyone who doesn't get it and still doesn't get it. Jesus went to the cross so that you could have everything that God wants to give to you today. You have His acceptance. You have His grace. You have a peace that will keep you going when everything else is anxious. You have an unconditional love that supersedes the love that you wish people would give. You have a joy that sustains you when there is no joy in the world. You have forgiveness that wipes the slate clean today, tomorrow, and every day. You have a goodness that just flows into your life and with a supernatural power of God working inside of you as God takes our sadness, as God takes our broken hearts, as God takes our misery and He turns it to joy. There is sadness at night, but there's joy in the morning and today is the morning. Today is the morning and every day is the morning. And you may enter back into sadness during the day, but God makes a promise to you that when you wake up the next day, your joy is in the morning because that's when Jesus comes out of the grave. God turns our sadness into joy. He rejoices over the lost who have come home and He celebrates when you get it. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you at home. Let's pray. God, my prayer is simple. If there's anyone in here today, or if there's anyone at home today, or if there's anyone who watches this on the replay, and you go, God, I'm lost. I'm just lost. I don't know what to do anymore. Nothing feels right. Nothing is working. Everything's messed up. If that's you, I want you to know you can come home And when you come home, God says, look, we're going to work on this together. It may not change overnight. It may not change in the next week. But I'm going to be with you, and you're in my home, and you're part of the family, and we're going to work on this together. And everything that I have is now yours, and everything you need, I will give it to you. And everything that you are looking for, you will find in me, because you were lost, but now you were found. If that's you, man, Father God, I am praying for whoever needs to hear that today, that you can come home, that you are home. And I want to pray also for everyone who's sitting there and going, God, I have been in church my whole life, but I just don't get it. I want to get it. I get the concepts. I understand the teachings. But I don't get you. I don't get how you could love me so much. 
I don't get how you can every day look at me and go, I'm going to forgive everything that's inside of you. I don't get how you can treat me with so much grace and so much love and so much forgiveness. I don't get why you would do this for me. I want you to get it. I want you to get it today. I want you to start the journey today of getting it. I want this, that, 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 that sadness to be turned to joy because you may not get it, but God gets you. And He wants you. And you may be struggling as that older brother, that older sister, and you're trying to do everything right, but it just ain't working. Well, today, may you get God. And may God get you. In his name we pray. And we all said together, amen. Amen.